So generically, our book says that the position of an object oscillating can be written as A cosine of omega t plus phi naught. If you know it's a negative cosine graph, you can write it as a negative cosine graph. If you know it's a negative sine graph, you can write it as a negative sine graph. This is just a generic form to remind you that it's sine or cosine. Okay. Turns out, the rate at which a mass will oscillate on a spring, whoa, that's kind of crazy. The rate at which it oscillates at is dependent on both how strong the spring is and how massive the mass is. So we have a certain rate this is oscillating at. But yet, if I put a mass, this one's twice as heavy. If I put a greater mass on the same spring, it doesn't oscillate as fast. It takes longer to complete that oscillation. If I take the same mass and connect it to a stronger spring, it will oscillate faster. So the rate at which this oscillation occurs at, this omega, is dependent on how strong the spring is itself and how much mass is hanging from it. Okay? We can derive the equation using this, Newton's second law. Negative kx is the force from the spring, ma, mass of the object. We're, we're assuming the springs are negligible mass, so the mass of the spring is very, very small compared to the mass of the object. And then the acceleration. If this is the generic function for position, then the generic function for velocity is the derivative of this, so negative omega a sine of omega t plus v naught. The generic function for acceleration will be negative omega squared a cosine omega t plus v naught. By the way, tell me what v max is in terms of this equation. Fabulous. Maximum acceleration? Fabulous. Okay, what I'm going to do, in place of x over there, I'm going to put this function that describes x. And in place of a, I'm going to put this function that describes a. So negative k times x, but x is a cosine of omega t plus v naught equals mass times acceleration, but acceleration is negative omega squared a cosine of omega t plus v naught. Perfectly legal. Just plugging in the equation that describes the position and the acceleration. Turns out the negative signs will cancel. The amplitudes will cancel, because there's an a on both sides. The cosine omega t plus v naught will cancel, because that's on both sides. That leaves us with a k on the left and an m omega squared on the right. That means omega is equal to the square root of k over m. That's the relationship that relates how strong the spring is. So k is the spring constant, the strength of the spring. M is the mass hanging from it. Bigger K, the stronger the spring, the bigger omega is. The faster the rate, more radians per second, more cycles per second, it oscillates faster. The bigger M though, M being in the denominator, the bigger M is, the smaller omega gets. So less cycles. This is called the natural or resonant frequency. 
for our mass spring system. So if you have a mass oscillating on a spring, then you can find the rate at which it's going to oscillate at if you know the spring constant and the mass. If you know the rate it's oscillating at, if you have a stopwatch and you can actually time it, you can work backwards. You can solve for omega, knowing how long it takes, and work backwards for m or k. So for example, here we know the mass, but we don't know the spring constant. It's not labeled on the spring. So we could actually use a stopwatch. We could use a stopwatch to measure period. Period is 1 over frequency. And frequency is 2 pi over omega. Or sorry, omega over 2 pi. So if we know period, we can solve for omega, plug it back into that equation, and solve for k. That would be easy to do. Okay. By the way, if we plug omega in here, allows us to solve for the period in terms of mass and k. Since omega is in the denominator, you get the square root of k over m in the denominator, which is the same thing as the square root of m over k in the numerator. It's just the division sign? Oh, sorry, I could... <laughs> m over k? Okay. Interestingly enough, the rate at which it's oscillating at right now, even though the motion is really small, it's not moving very far, the rate at which it's oscillating at right now is the same as it's oscillating at now with a bigger amplitude. The rate doesn't change. Right. The amplitude will change, but the amplitude does not affect the frequency. So regardless of whether I let this oscillate in just a little tiny oscillation. The speed stays the same. Mm -hmm. Yes. So amplitude does not affect the period. It does not affect the frequency. And vice versa, frequency doesn't affect the amplitude either. The amplitude is determined, in this case, by me, by how far I decide to push the mass down. I can choose to barely push it down so that it moves through just a really small little segment, or I can choose to push it down further so that it oscillates through a much larger distance. So for the same the mass, the period will be the same. frequency would stay the same. Yeah, for the same mass and spring. As long as I don't change anything about the mass and the spring, the angular frequency and the period stay constant. If I change the mass or the spring, then they would change. Okay. The farther the amplitude, though, the greater the maximum speed will be. It will move through its equilibrium position traveling faster than it would if it was just moving at a small amplitude. But the angular quantities are not affected. Now these generic equations that I just erased, those are assuming that there's no friction and no drag, so the amplitude would stay constant the whole time. Realistically, we've seen 
throughout the class period, the amplitude dies down and eventually that mass comes to rest. And that's because there's friction within the spring itself as it stretches and compresses. There's friction between the molecules.